Okay. Good afternoon. Um, my name is um, David Lynn. I'm a group leader in the infection immunity team at um, Samory and associate professor at Flinders School of Medicine. I'll be chairing this um, session. Um, as you can hear um, from my accent, I'm a bit of a, an interloper here, um, being originally from Ireland, and I'm also a bit of a, a, an interloper um, because my group is very much a, a basic um, immunology group rather than a, a clinical group. So I did, I did wonder why Helen had um, asked me to chair this session. I thought maybe it was our um, shared um, Irish heritage. We both come from the, the southeast of Ireland. Um, or maybe it's because we're collaborating on a range of, of vaccine uh, projects, um, including one um, investigating whether the gut microbiota can um, influence vaccine uh, responsiveness in early life. However, then I, I realized that the real reason was that we do a lot of animal work in my group. And uh, I think she realized that I wouldn't be unduly uh, phased by the surprise guests that we're expecting um, after Helen's talk. So without further ado, it's uh, my pleasure to um, introduce Helen Marshall, who probably needs no introduction to this group. Um, Helen is a um, senior NHMRC research fellow, uh, deputy director of uh, the Robinson, um, professor in vaccinology, Adelaide Medical School, um, medical director of the Vaccinology and Immunology Research Trials Unit at the Women and Children's Hospital, and uh, is a, a great colleague and, and collaborator of mine um, at SAMRI. So without further ado, Helen, please come and tell us about the epidemiology of meningococcal disease and uh, give us an update on the B part of the study. Thanks, Helen. Thanks very much, David, and thanks for being here um, to chair this meeting. I thought you were going to make some joke about your mouse work in the zoo. But anyway, that's good. So, um, uh, this is a very exciting opportunity um, for me because you may recall last year that we were really just talking about the possibility of a meningococcal B vaccine carriage study in South Australia and we've made incredible progress um, due to all the hard work of people here. I just wanted to um, have a hands up. Who's heard of the B part of its study in South Australia? Oh, excellent. Good response. Who's actually been involved in helping deliver the MenB? Oh, excellent. Good. Okay. So I'm going to start though by um, talking about the um, epidemiology of meningococcal disease in Australia because I think it's important to understand the context of um, the study that we're delivering. So my disclosure, um, many of you know, I've been an investigator on vaccine clinical trials over the last 15 years, sponsored by industry. I don't receive any personal payments, as David alluded to, I'm funded by NHMRC. And the um, be part of a study, or SAMMB vaccine herd immunity study, is sponsored by the University of Adelaide and funded by the Science. So epidemiology, I don't think this does work. If I, do anything, sorry. Go back. Um, I just wanted to show you um, what's been happening with meningococcus, invasive meningococcal disease over the last 15 years. And you'll see there that um, we've seen this quite dramatic reduction in total number of cases. So with the notifications on the y-axis and years on the x-axis. Um, from 3.5 per 100,000 down to 0.6 per 100,000 in 2013, quite a dramatic reduction. Um, and then this increase um, with um, data from 2017 year to date um, of about a 1.2 1, 1 per 100,000. So this reduction um, was mostly due to the incredible success, thank you, incredible success of the meningococcal C vaccine program. It was introduced in 2003. We, where there was a 99% reduction in zero group C to B. But in addition to that, you'll see there's been a reduction in cases of B in the, in the red as well, but a bit of an upswing in B in the last few years. And this increase over the last couple of years is the purple colour, the W, zero group W and some zero group Y. If we look at the age groups, um, distribution of meningococcal disease, the classic um, at-risk periods that you're aware of are the under five and then the uh, adolescent age group 15 uh, through to 24 years of age. And you'll see in those um, columns there, those age, age groups, that uh, most of the cases are due to B. This is data from this year, 2017. 
But we were seeing more cases in adults. You see that purple and orange represent the W and the Y disease that emerged. And the W has emerged as um, the hypervirulent um, clonal complex that um, caused um, outbreaks and continues to cause problems in the UK and some um, areas of South America. And as we talked about um, our Aboriginal population um, being at risk of infectious diseases um, earlier today, Aboriginal people have four times the risk of invasive meningococcal disease. So you'll see the number of cases there for Indigenous and non-Indigenous and you, you can tell straight away that they're overrepresented in the number of cases. So in children under five, you know we talk about an incidence rate, rate of the population, but in children under five, our rate is about five per 100,000. In Indigenous children, the rate is over 20 per 100,000. So they're a really important at-risk group for many cockle disease. And not only that, um, some work that Bing Wang, uh, my PhD student here, has done has actually shown that they're also at risk of um, severe complications, uh, higher risk of sequelae. And that's probably in relation to the fact that it takes longer than to receive medical care. If we look at notifications by state, this is where it gets really interesting and this is where it gets quite complicated in trying to understand um, what, in, what meningococcal vaccination programs we should be implementing in Australia. Um, is, uh, the states highlighted in yellow is uh, really where zero group W has predominated. And again, this is 2017 data. And in orange where um, zero group B predominates in South Australia and New South Wales. And the other, in the other states, it's a fairly mixed distribution of um, B, W and Y. If you look at the number of notifications to date, this is up to August, um, 69 of B, 55 of W and 35 of Y. And I was just going to um, indicate there too, it does, it does look, it's a little bit early, but it does look like we're going to have less cases of W overall this year than last year. In 2016, zero group W was the predominant zero group national. So we have vaccine programs. In Australia, as you're aware, meningococcal C vaccine is funded at 12 months of age in combination with many C vaccines. And then we have um, combination men ACWY vaccines. Now, in response to the increase in W disease that's been seen in um, both states and, um, and I guess in, in states where it hasn't predominated, where there's been concern that it may do so, um, the states have implemented their own state based funded programs for men ACWY. In the age group that is most likely to, where we're most likely to see a herd immunity benefit, the adolescents who carry the meningococcus. So those programs vary a little bit. They're state funded, they're not nationally funded, but we know from announcements from the um, uh, Federal Health Minister that um, nationally uh, a program in ACWY is something that's being looked at quite seriously. So we also have um, 4C men B vaccine. Um, to protect against zero group B, or VEC0, uh, which is recommended by ATAGI but not funded in a national or state funded program. And this vaccine's been to the um, applications for PBAC have been made and reject, rejected based on cost effectiveness estimates. But if you go back, like Stephen did, to the, um, the actual wording around those deliberations, they've actually looked wanting to see more evidence on the effectiveness in a population program and to determine where there's a herd immunity effect that we, as we saw with meningococcal C vaccine. And in trying to make decisions or think about decisions around which vaccines should be implemented, we obviously need to know about the epidemiology and it's confusing because each state's quite different. Um, we know, need to know what vaccines are available, but we also need to have a, an understanding of carriage of Neisseria you know, meningitis, um, which is where um, the study that I'm going to describe to you becomes very important. So what is carriage? Carriage is where you actually carry the bacteria and for meningococcal disease it's in the posterior pharynx right at the back of the throat. Um, there is a high um, increase, there's a rapid increase in carriage uh, in the adolescent age group that you can see there. Um, that's sort of 15 to 19 years and this is where um, the age group where um, individuals take on more risky um, behaviours. Such as, or maybe not risky, but you know, enjoyable risky, I don't know. So, um, so smoking is one. And the other is the more intimate activities we see adolescents take on board, which then disappear as they get married. And I know, <laughs> <laughs> I know I've said that before. So 
So um, I've got a couple of, I just wanted to, to see whether people understood that there are risk factors as well as with courage. What makes somebody more likely to carry the nice serum energy just than others? So who can call out for my beautiful illustrations here what risk factors there may be? Very good. Kissing. Kissing. Smoking. Excellent. What else have we got? Hubs and clubs. Absolutely. Crowded households. That's I know that's an unusual picture on the bed there for crowded households, but that's all I could find. Um, being male is a risk factor and just being young. So well done, you've all learned something that's great. So that leads me really to talk to you, give you an update about our B part of its study. And this study um, is a really important study and the more I talk about it, and I was just, I was asked to give an opening address at a meeting in Prague about this study. There was so much excitement about this study internationally um, it's, it's, it's quite incredible um, and what's uh, been a fabulous um, progress to date is that we have had so such um, great engagement from so many people really in the state to make sure that this is a very successful study. What it will do is it will answer the question about carriage prevalence in Australian adolescents, um, also risk factors, uh, whether our population is similar in the risk factors and uh, it will also address the question about whether there's an impact of uh, first MNB vaccine on carriage. To understand whether there is, is this additional herd immunity effect, which is really important for understanding implementing um, which vaccines we should be implementing in Australia. So, um, of course, a study of this size could not be done without the whole state taking this study on board, which has been uh, absolutely fabulous working with many of you here. Um, but also with government. So we, we wrote to the Premier, we wrote to the Health Minister, Education Minister to make sure that um, everyone understood the significance and importance of this study here for South Australia, but also um, nationally and internationally. Uh, we, um, I think we are unique in South Australia in that we, we do work very closely together. Um, we're able to do that um, between academia, um, between education and also um, in this situation with essay pathology being a central laboratory service to do all the laboratory work. We've had a fabulous engagement from local government. Local government um, immunisation nurses have delivered this whole project out in the community to an incredible standard, um, an absolutely excellent standard. Um, we've been out monitoring and um, it's just staggering how well it's all been done out in the community. We've had at the exec level for independent, public and um, Catholic uh, schools uh, at very high levels. We've had support for this study. And uh, again, Robinson Research Institute really supporting and leading this study and Samway have been with the whole genome sequencing. So why did we just, why did we think we needed to do a carriage study in South Australia? Well, South Australia, as many of you will know, has the highest um, rate of meningococcal disease in Australia. Now, it looks this, this year looks like NT and um, Tasmania might be tipping us a little bit but we are um, really up there with about two per 100,000 over the last couple of years. And up to this year, 80% of our cases, over 80% of our cases have been due to zero group B, so we're a little bit different to the other states. Um, this year we've had more W cases, so um, it's a bit lower, it's more like 70%, but we're still the, um, the main zero group causing disease here in South Australia. We've seen this increasing rate of zero group B disease in adolescents, we don't really understand why that is. Um, and whether that's um, related to carriage here in South Australia, whether it's to do with the strain that's circulating here in South Australia. And when I, when I say the strain that's circulating, it's really the New Zealand strain that caused the epidemic that ended up with an immunisation program back uh, 10, 15 years ago in New Zealand. Um, it's estimated that the vaccine uh, for CMNB or Bexero should, be 90, should cover 90% of the meningococcal um, B invasive disease here in South Australia. We have the centralised pathology service, we have um, an adolescent immunisation deli delivery through this immunisation program administered through local government, um, an amazing way of being able to del deliver this project in a very short and fast period of time which ne needed to happen. And um, we have a very stable population with low mobility so that's very good when you're doing a study and carriage trying to look at the impact of a vaccine following these um, students up over the next couple of years really important and we know that um, in South Australia we have the highest number of students actually applying for, in, for university in their own state so as evidence really of low mobility 
But I actually think it's more to do with South Australia being the safest state to live in because we're the only state that was not settled by convicts from the UK. <laughs> and a lot of them were the Irish, I hate to say. So, so I think people actually want to stay here. So that's really good for a carriage study as well. So um, if we look at um, more specifically disease in South Australia, I showed you, you can see that first graph, I'm still having a pointer, but the first graph really shows infant disease has been fairly stable, whereas adolescent cases have gone up in number. We've had four deaths in South Australia from an endococal disease, and I never remember that happening in, in my time. Um, three due to group B and one due to W, just you would have heard of just recently. If you look at the 2016 data there, um, the number of cases of that age group, we had 12 in adolescence deaths. Last year we only had four to date this year, so um, hopefully there's been some impact already um, from direct protection of those um, and school children have been involved in the study. So the study is in three parts and the first part was a pilot study we did looking at carriage rates in university students, uh, and I should, which I'll speak to second. But the cluster randomised controlled trial is our large trial comparing carriage prevalence in vaccinated versus unvaccinated year 11 and 12 students in South Australia. And we, I say 11 and 12, that might be confusing, but we're actually looking at the impact next year when our 10s and 11s will be 11s and 12s. Um, and then I will, I'll give you some um, data from uh, the um, university study that um, has now been completed. So just to, uh, as a reminder for those, or for those who don't know, the cluster randomised control trial, really strong design to be able to answer this question adequately. So informed consent, um, well, consent forms went out to all year 10s, 11s and 12s in South Australia. We could have just done this easily to some in metropolitan Adelaide. Um, kept it easier for us um, to administer, but we really wanted to give every student in South Australia an easy chance, including our remote Aboriginal um, children, children living in remote um, APY lands. So um, once the consent forms are in, the schools have been randomised to Group A or Group B, and in Group A, um, all the 10th, 11th and 12th who are participating um, undertake a questionnaire looking at the risk factors, as we've talked about, have a swab taken, um, they get an iTunes voucher to um, reimburse them for their time and effort on the question because it's quite long. And then they have two doses, as you'll all agree, have two doses of MEMB vaccine. The other, the group B schools, they do have the swab, the questionnaire, and then they all come back at 12 months, uh, yeah, 12 months later, and they all have a posterofandrial swab again, and then the group B um, students get the two doses of vaccine. So at the end of the 15 months of the study, everyone's been immunised. So it's very important for carriage studies that we um, do adequate throat swabs and that it's standardised, that everyone's doing the same thing. So we've made, we made a video, we've had um, day, practice days, as you can see, everyone had to practice on each other. We got consent, of course, before we did that. Um, and uh, that's been uh, very, very useful, very important for the study. The risk factor questionnaire um, was based on a study in the UK um, because the UK are really the experts in carriage, particularly around women with cocker disease. So we asked them about sex, as in gender, smoking, <laughs> overcrowding, antibiotic use, intimate kissing, number of partners, number of nights out, increasing weight and ethnicity. And uh, youth, when we got our youth advisors to have a look at all of this material, they said, oh, hell, I've got this stupid. No one's going to know what intimate kissing is. So they advised us to put kissing with tongue. So that's in the questionnaire, kissing with tongue. But uh, they seem to have managed it. I mean the questionnaire. So, um, <laughs> so, as I mentioned, this could not have been possible at all if it wasn't for the immunisation nurses out in the community administering the school immunisation program. But that's been administered by local government. It's been fantastic working with local government and you know, we'd like to do another trial with <laughs> like I said, they might not want to. <laughs> we love we love working with you. So we've had um, with obviously um, local government um, and um, uh, Adelaide and obviously in rural locations as well. We did training, we thought it was really important to have all the nurses involved, um, trained and the admin um, staff helping. So we've gone to all these different locations. I must have been, I'd much rather be in an A380 than these little planes, but we all survived. We got out, trained, over 5,000, well, 5,000 kilometres travelled, um, over 250 nurses trained and, and 35 admin staff um, to make sure everyone understood 
the project and what we were trying to achieve. As I mentioned, um, to me personally, it was really important that everyone had the same opportunity to receive the vaccine and be part of the study. And I, um, so a lot of um, work and effort went into um, enabling this research project to be um, administered in the APY lands. And um, um, Adrienne Storkin, who many of you will know, um, did a fantastic job. She drove around for two weeks, travelled over 2,000 kilometres to eight schools for 82 students. But those 82 students were really important. And 59 of those um, are enrolled in the study, which I think is an incredible achievement. So we, um, we held catch-up clinics. Uh, so councils held extra catch-up clinics. We found that there were students who had registered their interest to be in the study but hadn't turned up on the, um, the school vaccination visit. And this was a way of giving them another chance to um, come in and be vaccinated and have their throat swabs taken. So we had clinics at the Women's and Children's Hospital you see there as well. We have a vaccine safety um, committee and Associate Professor Christine McCartney who is an, really an expert in vaccine safety, heads that and monitors any adverse events that are reported. And we had, um, we had a, a, a very, um, I guess, robust communication and community engagement campaign because, as I said, it really was something that the state had to take on. There's no point in us sitting over in our you know, immunisation clinic or research facility and expecting students to come in and be part of a study. We had Parents had to understand the study, students had to understand the study, teachers. Um, it just went on and on. So it was very much about engaging a public relations company to um, communicate what the study was about. It's about being aware about the new property disease, being informed, then being involved, making sure the school was involved and being in the night. And we ran a commercial that hopefully many of you saw from January to April. We had ambassadors, we used Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Snapchat, and <laughs> people see themselves. We had, you know, ambassadors, ambassadors' parents who lost their um, son, Jack, from an improper disease, uh, both had um, recovered. So, okay, so lab, we take two swabs, as I told you, 12 months apart, and then we do, um, we've got a SA pathology does testing for. Um, the actual genetic material of the meningococcus and uh, we culture them and then they go for whole genome sequencing. And that's all, all those study processes are underway at the moment. But what I wanted to just show you is the preliminary study, um, really round uptake and what an amazing achievement our immunisation nurses in the community have done. So we have uh, almost 34,500 students in South Australia recruited and involved and enrolled in the study over a three month period. Now that's a very tight period to be doing that. Um, but it's really important for the, um, the the study design that we were able to do that in over three months. And I cannot believe that we have not lost a swab. In fact, no swabs are lost. We have five swabs that actually don't have personal details attached, but that's been sorted. So amazing achievement. Um, over 37,000 students returned to Simpson. And we had over 95% of schools in South Australia involved. Again, amazing support from education. And up to last week, we had 93% of the seed two doses. Again, amazing achievement out in the community. Some of what I called in unintended consequences um, by the parents. I've been told parents have actually who've never had their children vaccinated because they're under vaccination, have their children enrolled and they'll be part of the study. And the children have received the first vaccine ever. We've had um, students followed up in the remote AP Wylands who, who have had difficult following up. Um, they've been able to do catch up vaccinations and been able to do health checks with some really important outcomes because they've been in the study. We've also had adolescents, as you've seen, engaged in health decisions, improved health literacy, students telling teachers about meningococcal disease, and um, the number of emails I've had about research projects, the number of interviews I've done. Um, uh, BPAR has got to be the most popular year 12 research project for 2017. And I'm finishing off with some acknowledgement slides. As you can imagine, there's an enormous number of people are involved in this. To be part of a team in my group with Susan and Pip and Mark and Kate and Leslie and Cherie and the Virtue team and others within SA Health, Maureen and Anne um, and SA Pathology Operations Committee, um, our International Scientific Advisory Committee, which has made up half of the of UK experts in courage and half experts uh, in Australia. And our reference group, which has a mem membership, everyone, every stakeholder involved in the study, 
And I've just highlighted there our youth advisors who have been invaluable in providing information about how we can best communicate with adolescents about the study. And thank you so much to our immunisation providers who just do an amazing job, just, you know, international recognition of, of what you're doing out there. So thank you. Thanks, Helen. A really awe-inspiring study. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. Any questions? I just mainly want to congratulate you and particularly everyone else in the room. This is an extraordinary study and the fact that you could do it with the immunisation providers as the workforce, I mean it is just so powerful and this put South Australia on the international map. Um, so uh, my, and, and Australia, but we're proud of the convicts <laughs> from the rest of the country, <laughs> will be very proud of, proud of the work you, I just, this is such a, a perfect example of public health research that I, I just think I'm overawed with the quality of the work you're doing. My question is, if the carriage rates in your school students are at that same level, will the study be powered to show an impact, yeah. impact of the vaccination? Yeah, really good question and something we've been looking at very carefully. So um, from the early data, it looks like it's a little bit lower, but um, goes up with each year level. Where it's the, um, Our sample size is actually determined by the carriage rates next year at the 12 months, which will be a bit higher because as the students get older, they, the cash rates go up. We've also done a little bit of an analysis um, and looked at our, you know, the st statistics of it and some of the assumptions we made actually gave us a bigger sample size than we need. So it's all coming together like we will be able to answer. But and also the project three, which I haven't mentioned, which is looking at the effect on the population level um, after implementation is a really important part of the study as well. So we do expect to be able to answer the question. But thank you, and thanks very much for your comments. Really appreciate that. We have time for maybe one more quick question. We have one here. <laughs> that's a whole um, discussion itself. But we're actually, no, that we, um, we have planned that the year 12 students in group B that are not vaccinated actually come back to councils, but also come back to the medical centres in the universities. Because about a third of students, or 35%, will end up at universities, so we can use the clinics there. Um, we're providing them with letters, um, sending a letter out to them so that they have a list of all the places that they can get vaccinations. It's such an important question and so important. Not only the year 12, but students that leave school in year 10, 11, we want them to have the opportunity to be immunised, absolutely. So um, we are looking at um, maybe involving them in really project three as well, but um, that's the plan, absolutely, that they have the opportunity to be vaccinated. Okay, thank you, Helen. Please join me in thanking Helen for a great talk. Okay, good afternoon. Welcome back. We get started. Um, next up, um, we have a, a double team of um, Luda Mononchinov and Miss um, Jenny Fife, who are going to tell us about successful implementation of community vaccine programs against vaccine preventable diseases in rural SA. Uh, Luda is advanced nurse manager uh, for the Country Health SA Local Health um, Network, and uh, Jenny is a registered nurse at the Seduna uh, District Health Services. So if you join me in welcoming both of them to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, David. Everybody can hear me? Now, I don't have any declarations, I'm sorry. I thought about it. I have two daughters in the MenB study, so I can t declare that. I've been involved in HPV programs and school programs and so on for a long time. So I guess that's as far as I can go. Uh, my whole household supports uh, South Australian AFL teams. Um, what more can I say? <laughs> so thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, and today what I'd like to do is just present on two vaccination responses that um, Country Health SA local health network sites had an opportunity to be part of in the past 12 months. Um, for those of you, first of all, who's here from Country Health SA local health network? Whoa, 
Excellent. So you, um, those of you who aren't, this is a map of our Country Health SA local health network and the two sites that had a vaccination response are Sejuna on the left and Jenny will speak about that site and Gawler um, which is the measles um, response which is close to Metro Adelaide. As you can see um, we, c we have six regions, they're the different colours on the map but, um, and they cover most of South Australia but only 25% of the population. So we are we have got a huge uh, area, um, 64 hospitals, 220, 220 sites, community health sites and other, uh, um, other sites, and we are the largest aged care service provider in rural South Australia as well. So we do have our finger in a few different pies, and we do have a few different focuses. Up until um, November last year, we weren't and we have never, as a health network, been involved in the vaccination response for a community. We've been part of immunisation programs over the years for um, scheduled vaccinations, but we've never actually been asked to be part of a, um, a response to an outbreak um, of diseases. So in um, the first uh, response we had was in Gawler, and just giving you a picture of where Gawler is, it's not far from Adelaide, it's only about, I don't know, half an hour from uh, Elizabeth, Lowell McEwen. It's about an hour's drive here from CBD Adelaide. So it's really one of the closest um, hospitals that we've got um, that's in our network that's in the closest to the metro. These are just some photos of the health service. Now, what happened was, um, those of you who may remember, in the media last year, we had quite a few cases of measles confirmed, and there was a, a confirmed cluster in Gawler. So what happened, the first case was at the beginning of September, the sixth case was 6th of November. So, um, and what w so what we were looking at was for those who were not immune to measles, those born, before, um, born after 1966, um, those who have never had measles disease, um, those who didn't have documented doses of, two doses of measles. So up to, up to the sixth case, there was a lot of contract, contact tracing happening with the department. It was a collaborative uh, partnership between the department and our health service. And what we were doing was either offering immunoglobulin, if it was within the suitable time frame, or uh, the MMR vaccine in accordance with the, um, the series of national guidelines for measles, the song. Um, the media was well aware of the outbreaks and it was on Facebook, it was on the SA Health Facebook site, it was in the um, 7 News, the 10 News, it was all through Facebook, it was in local messengers, local papers, um, on the TV and so on. So we had an outbreak confirmed on Tuesday the 8th of November at 11 o'clock. We had an emergency meeting, half an hour, and within half an hour I was leaving the office. My office is in King William Street in Adelaide and I was heading to Gawler to lead a um, a response, an outbreak response to measles. For the fifth and sixth cases, we had to contact 94 different patients that would have walked through our emergency department because one of the um, cases, one of the final two cases, was a staff member at Gawler Health Service. Um, so we phoned every single person to determine whether they were born before, 19, before 1966, whether they've had measles before, whether they had evidence of two documented doses of measles, um, and whether they were alone, because we had lists of people that were patients in the ED, but we, they had family members too. They had people picking them up and so on. So it was huge interviews that we were doing. And they were asked to come back to the ED through a separate entrance to be vaccinated or given immunoglobulin, depending on when they were in the emergency department. So the following day we had another teleconference uh, with the uh, Communicable Disease Control Branch and it was determined that there will be mass vaccination clinics for the entire community of Gawler. So this is the first time Gawler Health Services had to do this um, or any other um, of our hospitals have had to do this. We had to find a location that was separate to the hospital because as we know measles is an airborne disease. So we had to be separate, we needed to contain and keep the healthy and the sick separate. So within three hours we had a clinic running, we had a clinic up and running. We had, we had the Women's Health Centre, which was available, or wasn't available, but we made it available. Um, the staff were moved to a different location, um, the patients were uh, rerouted to a, the different location, so we had the entire health centre to ourselves. 
we had to put signs up because this building was 50 metres from the actual hospital. It was across the car park from the hospital. So there was appropriate signs from within the hospital, from the car park, from the road, just to make sure that the people coming in for the measles vaccine were going to the right place. Um, because the hospital had to keep going business as usual and we basically had to staff another site like a mini hospital. We had to um, organise appropriate standing me medication orders, develop them, endorse them, and I had to upskill nurses who have never immunised um, a measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. So they needed to know the risks and benefits of vaccination, ask if the uh, women are pregnant, do not give if they're not sure, um, and so on. Just little risks and benefits that we had to um, prepare the staff with. Resources ordered, stationary um, and clinical supplies found, fridges moved from one location to this, to, do, to this location. It was also going to be 35 degrees that week, so we had to set up air conditioners. The waiting area was in a carport, so we had to set up fans and air conditioners. We had to have chilled bottles of water. All of these things we needed to com uh, consider for running this mass vaccination clinic vaccines ordered and then we were having electrical storms so we had to find alternate um, storage facilities for where there was a generator attached to it so that we weren't losing vaccines because we could afford not to have vaccines on site and anyone that was determined to ha need immunoglobulin was sent to the emergency department through the alternate entrance. I have to say it was a team effort. Everybody came on board from the gardening, gardeners, from the um, uh, contractors from the directors of nursing, the regional directors, everybody came on board and within three hours we were ready to go and jab the first patients. So this is what we expected. <laughs> I have to say this is what we expected but the first couple of hours it wasn't really like that. The following day this is what we got. So they were lining up. Um, they were talking to each other like they were long lost friends. When you ask them, oh how long have you guys known each other? Oh we've only just met in the waiting area. That type of thing. We had a lot of elderly community members that were walking in on their frames that we did have conversations with. Um, they were doing their bit for the community. They heard it on the news, they heard it from the doctor, they heard it in the shopping centre. They wanted to do their bit for the community because it was all through Gawler. Everybody was talking about it. Everybody was just really happy. We had no need for crowd control. Everybody was just making friends and so on. So. This, um, we, I think we, we only vaccinated 698 people over those days. Um, the first, first, as soon as they arrived, we only had three uh, vaccination set, um, desks set up or areas set up. We had to double that because of the people waiting in the waiting area. We ran out of vaccine within the first morning. We had to close the clinic for, the, for uh, two hours while we had another lot, a lot of vaccine delivered. Um, we did... We had uh, children vaccinated from nine months of age because it was considered an outbreak and according to the song that was part of the recommendation. Um, we also checked the immunisation reg register of families of five kids coming in to make sure they've had two dose documented doses of measles, mumps, rubella. If not, we would offer them a dose of measles, mumps, rubella even if, if it, even if it was before the recommended doses, uh, it was recommended as long as at least a month interval. Any children that we vaccinated, we um, entered onto the immunisation register up until the age of 18 years of age. So we did have opportunity, I did have access to the register. We had to set that up within a couple of hours too, and we were able to enter them onto the register. Um, and we had a, ro a rotating roster of staff. Um, when I showed you the map of country health, we have regions, the coloured sections. Um, they all work like an organisation. Each region works together. So we needed staff. We called hospitals from Victor Harbour to from Strath to Mount Barker to Murray, uh, not Murray Bridge, that's not part of the region, but from different hospitals, staff were coming on board and they were more than happy to be there to um, uh, make sure that we had enough staff to vaccinate. We spoke to many, many people. Like I said, um, gentlemen on their fr walking frames came in for their vaccinations and we explained it to them. They were more than happy and they left. Uh, so when we ran out of vaccines, they were more than happy to return two hours later. Um, there was no issues at all. Everybody wanted to be part of the, pro the vaccination response. What we did learn from this, and we were able to um, uh, assist, this, um, provide information to the Sejuna response, was that we needed a clinical lead. Um, what we, couldn't, what we didn't have access to was healthcare worker immunisations. So they weren't readily accessible information. 
um, the vaccination histories or the serology. We had to uh, continue to get that sorted. I know we are slowly going through that process, but that's something that would have been, um, we would have had a much more rapid response. Um, what we needed to also remember was that when we did the contact tracing from the emergency department, we only looked at the staff that were rostered on, but there were physios walking through providing physio support. Um, uh, there were OTs coming through. There were other disciplines coming through at the time that we weren't aware of until they came through our mass vaccination clinics. And then we had to reassess the need for immunoglobulin or vaccination. So, and it's, there were contractors that were uh, fixing the doors and so on. Because measles is an airborne disease, it's something that we needed to consider. It's not the same for all, all diseases, but measles, we did need to consider that. And it was vital for a rapid response for all staff to be on board, um, from carrying furniture from one building to another, from setting up resources, from ordering resources and so on. But it was also important for us to have access to some experienced staff, preferably all experienced staff, but at least some so that we can have uh, people answering questions um, from community members and from other staff members. So these were our learnings that we, we were able to apply to further responses and I will hand over to Jenny to do this as the Gina one. Thank you. Um, thanks everyone. Um, just a, a bit of history, um, the background. We had three meningococcal W cases diagnosed in Sedona um, between December 2016 and February 2017. These were the first serotype W um, reported from rural South Australia. They were all um, cases of children um, and two were invasive and one was a conjunctivitis. Uh, the close contacts of all of these three cases were given antibiotic clearance and we also had to vaccinate 301 people during this time. After the third case and in light of the outbreak um, that occurred in Kalgoorlie late 2016, the decision was made that we would commence a community-wide um, vaccination program. That was met with some trepidation by the team at Sejuna because we did wonder how in the hell we were going to accomplish that. <laughs> so it was decided that residents from um, towns such as Sejuna, Thevena, Denal Bay, Kniba, um, communities such as Yalata, Skadesco um, and Oak Valley, um, towns as Penong and Smoky Bay would all be entitled to a free vaccination so that involved um, anyone from two months of age upwards. So Sejuna is about 800 kilometres um, from Adelaide. We're about 470 kilometres from Port Augusta and 400 odd kilometres from um, Port Lincoln. So we are fairly isolated. We're not a big hospital. We've got 15 acute beds. Um, we do have an obstetric service. Um, we do have a couple of dialysis um, chairs um, and aged care, of course. So um, the map's not very good, but they're some of the areas that we went to to do the um, actual clinics. So the questions were, how are we going to do this? So we needed a coordinated approach. It couldn't just be us. So we had to um, work closely with um, the rest of Country Health, with SA Health and CDCB um, and other um, NGOs. So um, we needed the clinics to be both centrally and, and outreach. Um, we needed venues. Um, it wasn't possible to use the hospital. The hospital had to continue on as a day-to-day -day running. We needed to organise um, resources. It's not as easy in the city as just being able to order something and get it the next day. Um, it might take a week to get resources. Um, and we had to get things such as rubbish bins. Um, when you go down the shop in Sejuna, and there's not many shops there, let me tell you, um, and rubbish bins were $15 each, and we thought, oh, no, we're not paying for you know 10 of those. So we just got buckets, and we put bin liners in the buckets. So um, we had to do a bit of thinking of outside the square. We needed to also know what the clinics would look like. Um, how were they going to run? Um, 
we had to work out how we were going to staff the clinics um, and to do that um, every organisation came on board. We had local organisations offering um, staff as ushers. We worked with the um, Aboriginal um, agencies up there because we've got such a high Aboriginal um, population. Um, it was important that they were there to, to aid um, the Indigenous people to feel comfortable to come and, and get vaccinated. Um, we decided the clinics would actually um, flow like a polling booth, so we'd have ushers out the front, we would have um, admin section out the front, which would be divided in two, so one section you would get your um, paperwork and consent forms and information, you'd then bring that back to a, a separate admin section who would check that it was okay, you'd then be given a number like you were lining up at the Coles Deli or whatever and be shown through to the waiting area and from there you'd go straight through um, to the vaccination um, clinics and from there you'd go into a um, post-vaccination um, area for 15 minutes to be looked at. Um, so this is what some of the clinics look like. The first one was the Sejuna one which we held in the town hall and the Sejuna Council very kindly let us have that for the full two weeks of the clinics um, and we were allowed to leave that set up um, for that two weeks. They cancelled anything that they needed um, or, or that they had planned in there. The next, the one below was at Kaniba which is an Aboriginal um, area uh, and that was in their little community town. Then the one at Penong was just in their town hall and that was even smaller. And then the Smoky Bay one was at the community club. Um, Oak Valley, where we had to go, was an actual plane trip, so we were limited as to how many people we could fly up there. It was just a single engine aircraft, and I opted out of that one because I don't like flying. Um, so, because uh, otherwise it's a, at least a five hour drive up there, and that just wasn't um, going to happen. So some of the agencies involved there you can see and, and they were wide and varied um, and encompassed all sorts of, of um, agencies. So the next thing we needed to know was um, sorry, um, when were we going to do it. So we needed to do it as soon as possible. Um, it was no use planning it for you know a month, two months down the track. So a decision was made um, that we would have um, three weeks of clinics, two weeks would be in Sejuna and we'd have one week travelling to those outreach clinics um, and we would then come back um, and reassess how we were going and what we needed to do from, from then on. So as you saw we had um, the various clinics um, in the outreach centres. The clinic times um, we had, um, in Sejuna, we started the clinics at um, 2 o'clock until 6 o'clock in the evening, Monday to Friday, but staff would be rostered on from um, 1 o'clock till 9 o'clock. We'd have a, a briefing before each clinic. Everyone knew what their roles were. We had a clinic lead, um, and that was the go-to person um, if there were any problems. Um, the outreach clinics, um, they varied from 11 o'clock to 4 o'clock, depending on how far we actually had to drive to get there. Um, when we went to Yalata, that's 215 kilometres away, so that was a sort of a 7.30 start time to get there. Um, and they actually did an amazing job out there to get all their community to come in, and they did that by actually offering them lunch. So they were quite happy to all turn up and we actually didn't even take enough vaccines out there so we actually um, we had to send some more the next day. Um, how do we get the message out there? So we had, we're a bit different out in Sejuna in that we don't get um, South Australian TV, we have um, Northern Territory um, news, we have 
Queensland news or we have Melbourne news or Sydney news, but we don't get <laughs> Adelaide news. Don't ask me why, but that's how it works. So we had our local radio stations um, and we had our um, EO Don um, doing some interviews there. Um, media and comms from SA Health um, provided um, Facebook feed. We had posters everywhere. It was on the SA Health internet and the good old grapevine worked wonders. We certainly had people ringing up asking, even before it got out, um, when, they were when the clinics were happening and what was going on. So we estimated the numbers to be vaccinated at about 4,000 um, and the numbers vaccinated up to the 30th of June when the program actually officially ended was 3,571. We've had an additional 96 people vaccinated post the program because we had um, a number of vaccines left over um, and the majority of these happened after we had another meningococcal, uh, meningococcal W diagnosed in an adult that had decided they didn't want to be vaccinated during the program. Um, so total numbers to date are 3,667, um, which is 92 percent of the estimated population that we thought we'd have to vaccinate. So what did we learn? We learned to deal with any issues that arose quickly. We had changes to information at the last minute. We had, and so we had to reprint thousands of documents. Uh, we had no power when we arrived at one of the clinics, so we had to run around and find a generator. We had to, um, we used the community paramedics as our post-vaccination observers. They had to leave at one stage to go to an emergency a couple of hundred k's away. So then we had to work out how we were going to do that. So luckily we managed to get another ambulance in um, and they were able to go. We had staff unavailable at the last minute. Um, but yeah, we just rolled with the punches really. We also found it would have been easier to have an area map rather than a list of towns included simply because we did find some people a little aggro because they didn't live in those towns and they were precluded from getting the vaccination, whereas if we could have just shown them a map and if they lived outside of that area, it might have been easier for them to take in. As um, Luda said, we found having a clinic lead was beneficial. It allowed for smooth running of the clinics. Um, anyone that had any questions um, were able to go to that clinic lead and it, it just kept the clinic running. Um, we had written descriptions of what everyone's roles were and they um, understood what they needed to do. It would have been beneficial to have a single number or person um, from CDC be available for the duration of the clinics because we weren't experts in all this vaccination um, questions and whatever. Um, but um, we managed to get by. We did think about offering weekend clinics, but resource issues were um, a major reason why we didn't, but perhaps we should have, um, and should we have extended the duration of the clinics. Um, and again, um, there's a resource issue. We did, after having the three weeks of clinics, um, make available um, times at the GP Plus in Sejuna and also at Sejuna Kinimba um, Aboriginal Health Services where people could go in and get um, their vaccinations if they couldn't have attended the clinics. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one thing I learnt was to have lists for everything so you knew um, what you needed and you could tick that off because you had to pack up and go um, from different places every day. And that was a vital thing, and that was one thing um, we learned from Luda. Um, we had Luda come up for the first week, which was most um, useful for us. And um, we just found that it was an amazing um, collaborative approach, and um, it wouldn't have worked um, if we hadn't had um, such a, an amazing group of um, clinicians. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and departments that all work together um, to, to make this such a successful program.
Thank you, Jenny and Luda. Um, Helen, you thought you had logistic nightmares to deal with, but clearly in the real world there are much bigger problems. Any questions? I'll ask a quick question. Or we have one here. I, I was just wondering, is it just going to be the one vaccine that all these participants get? Um, it was um, the children that anyone up to 12 months um, had to have either two or three, depending on their age. Um, anyone over 12 months, um, once we got them the Mendrix, because we had to swap vaccines sort of halfway through, um, they only received one. Unless they were immunocompromised, and then they may need it too, but we've had a follow-up program that we've had to go through as well for all of those issues. Any other questions? Did you mention that you had some people that wanted to be vaccinated but didn't meet the criteria, or was no, that an issue? I did the meetings. Yeah. Oh, I think um, in community, what, what I've noticed since I've come across the country is it's a big country town, and everybody wants to work together, everybody wants to do the, their bit, everybody, um, if they hear about it, yes, we've got to do our bit, and even though they don't need to, they'll come, come forward and say, what do I do, what do I do? Okay, please join me in thanking Luda and Jenny. Now, uh, our last talk today, um, unfortunately, um, Professor Anne Kohler couldn't um, make it today, so we have um, Dr. Doug Shaw, a public health physician from SA Health, who's going to give us a talk on healthcare worker immunisation. Shout out what your vaccine preventable disease was, or measles, pertussis, measles, meningococcal, rotavirus, everything, right. Yeah. Okay, good. Next question. This is the exercise before we get going, you see, because you've been sitting down for too long. If as a health professional, I want you to stand up, if you've ever had to talk to another health professional who's either refused or been very hesitant about vaccines that they really should have as a health professional. Oh dear. I, I won't ask you what vaccine that was. Okay. Well, well, this talk might actually be interesting then. So it's up there. So I'm just going to go through a little bit of the background and context point out the main features of this policy directive that SA Health has developed, show you some of the model and supporting documents that you can access and use in, in implementing the policy directive, and also we'll mention some of the implementation issues, and there should be enough time for some discussion, because those is probably where you have most of your questions. So I think the little exercise we've just done has answered this question, why is it important? So it's pretty obvious, isn't it? Vaccine preventable diseases can be transmitted and they can be acquired in a healthcare setting. Um, and part of the drive for the policy directive, apart from being really good public health, is there is a duty of care for SA Health and all employers to provide a safe working environment. And we also need to meet uh, accreditation standards. And they've been some of the drivers behind this policy directive, a workplace immunisation program. So, those of you who've been around a little while may remember from 2010 we had some immunization guidelines and we started developing a policy directive but we didn't really get a lot of high level management support until somewhat fortuitously we had some outbreaks in healthcare facilities, particularly pertussis at the Women's and Children's Hospital. Anyone remember that? Yeah, Alan does. Uh, and there have been measles outbreaks and so on. At the same time, uh, accreditation standards were coming in and the time was right to develop a policy directive. Also, the new edition of the Immunisation Handbook came out and suddenly our 2010 guideline was out of date. And so as a temporary measure, we developed a policy guideline. So not quite with the same strength as a policy directive, 
It's just that for a policy directive, you really have to go through quite a lengthy consultation period, and we wanted to do that properly, so we didn't want to rush it. So temporarily, we developed this uh, policy guideline. Um, and it was a tediously long bureaucratic process, I'm sorry to say, but we, we're, we're there. Uh, there were lots of delays along the way, um, but we had some really good consultation, particularly with education providers, so healthcare workers, students doing clinical placements was an issue for them as to compliance with um, immunisation requirements, as well as to current SA Health staff <coughs> and new staff wanting to join um, SA Health. So we put it to our, what was then portfolio executive in December 2016, and you're getting a sneak preview because we, while it was approved on the 1st of August, we're timing our launch for the 9th of October for a couple of reasons. There's, we want to make sure that everything's well coordinated, we've got our communications package to coordinate in a, in a, a well-structured manner. We want our supporting documents available so that people can access them straight away. And also because our Chief Public Health Officer, Professor Paddy Phillips, is back from leave on that day. <laughs> um, so we're going to have the model and supporting documents online and the communications package. So what are the features of this particular policy directive? So we've clearly defined who it covers, and we refer to category A and category B healthcare workers. Category A, direct contact with patients, blood, body, fluids. Category B, indirect contact. And really your risk is not your job title, it's your work role. So a doctor may not necessarily need to be um, covered by the policy directive if they're in an admin role. So it, it really depends on the work you're doing. The policy directive current, covers current SA Health staff, those applying for positions in SA Health, contract locum agency workers, volunteers and student healthcare workers. Quite some time ago we realised that it was not going to be possible to mandate vaccination. So what we've mandated is it's mandatory to participate in the screening process. So all healthcare workers should know their vaccination status. And we really felt that was politically and from a reasonable public health point of view a way to go because Log the next logical step is that um, healthcare workers would then move on to vaccination if they knew that they were not immune. Not all, and we'll talk about that later. Um, so vaccination would not be compulsory, but we'll talk a bit about some of the consequences from that. So what did we decide to cover? Some of these are pretty obvious, and you shouted out many of them. So the measles, mumps, rubella, varicella. Pertussis is covered, diphtheria, tetanus, fortuitously are, are grouped with pertussis in the vaccine, but obviously we don't really need to cover diphtheria and tetanus from a healthcare worker point of view. And hepatitis B for the category A healthcare workers, those with direct or indirect contact. We've followed the immunisation handbook, so hepatitis A is recommended for some healthcare workers, particularly those working in rural, remote, indigenous communities. And we've put poliomyelitis in there but we're not requiring people to provide documentation. I have no idea where any documentation would be for my polio vaccination, but I'm sure I had my three oral Sabin vaccines a long, long time ago. But again, that's not really an issue for healthcare workers in an Australian setting. Influenza was a tough one. It's not covered in the policy directive, but strongly recommended. And there are some good reasons for that. The most simple is it's the pragmatic aspect. If you've got a policy directive that says you need to be immune against certain diseases. You've got to measure that compliance, and you can do that one-off for most of the vaccines, but for flu, we, every year are we going to have some way of, we're not, we're not going to be able to, in a large institution like SA Health, assess compliance every year, and if we don't assess compliance, people are soon going to know what they can get away with, <coughs> and we won't get much further down there. However, there's, there's a strong argument for mandating um, influenza vaccination. Tuberculosis isn't covered by this policy directive because we have another one that covers that. And obviously hepatitis C and HIV are not vaccine preventable diseases. But from the point of view of student healthcare workers, prospective staff, and even existing staff, we're wanting them to know their status in relation to HIV and hepatitis C. There's no requirement to disclose to the employer, but obviously if a healthcare worker was, there are some guidelines that they should follow and should have a um, a specialist managing their situation. So 
one of the early versions, well, as you might imagine, the, the policy directive developed along the way. And after particularly, um, this is where the value of consultation comes in, we decided to separate out refusal. And notice we're using the word refusal, not the very polite declined. We made that decision to, to move to a slightly stronger term. But we've separated that out from those people who are non-responders, and particularly hepatitis B. So these are people who are committed to vaccination. They've gone through the appropriate um, hepatitis B vaccination schedule, the boosters and so on, but they're still non-responders. We didn't want them to be disadvantaged, and we can put protection around them and their patients. And in fact, the issue for, is mainly for, for the healthcare worker there rather than the patients, because they're not protected against exposure to hepatitis B. And also, so that would be a, a fairly small group, and also another, what we think will be a very small group, is people with a genuine medical contraindication to vaccination. We didn't want them to be discriminated against either, even if they were perhaps considering a, a health care career. But again, we would need to assess their risk and the sorts of um, work that they might be doing, the patients they might be uh, caring for. So some of the strong features in the policy directive, and we did get very high level um, SA health management support for this. If you're a student healthcare worker and you are not compliant with the policy directive, you will not be offered a clinical placement in an SA health service facility. Pretty strong. And I think, think you're gonna have much chance of getting a, a clinical placement in the private hospitals either. They're pretty much lined up with um, very similar recommendations. The same applies to prospective employees. If, if someone is applying for a job and they become the preferred candidate, they need to go through the, the usual rigmarole, police clearance, this TB clearance, and so on. So the immunization uh, compliance will be another aspect of that, and they will not be offered the position unless they are compliant with the policy directive. So obviously there are some issues here, and we've developed some documents that will hopefully help support staff who are dealing with these situations. So a refusal form, and we do have a, a document that we're prepared for an immunization expert advisory panel. So we'd bring together a small group of people who could assess on a case-by-case -case situation people who were refusing vaccination um, and look at their particular circumstances and make recommendations. We hope that that panel would be used very rarely. And in fact, we've had a We've really only ever done this once in the last few years, so hopefully it will remain a rare situation. The policy directive outlines roles and responsibilities, as all good policies should, so we've got the senior level management, and their role is mainly supporting and the implementation of the policy directive, right down to the real hard work, which is the worker health nurses in our local health networks and ambulance services, dental service, and in country health, the infection control practitioners. These are the people who will be doing most of the work. For students, obviously, it may well be uh, general practice and um, in particular university health services. We're planning to record immune status, this is for SA Health staff, on our CRIS21 health assessment screen. It's not ideal, but we think it will be functional. And we're hoping to be able to generate reports so people don't have to complete reports using our what does it stand for? I did write that down. An analytical reporting system. The local analytical reporting system. Uh, and we will discuss with education providers about how they can let us know compliance of healthcare worker students without it being an onerous requirement on them. So the model documents, the documents to support the process. So we've developed field tested and gone through a few iterations with um, particularly university health services for students, a screening questionnaire that a healthcare worker can complete, bring along the relevant documents to a doctor or a worker health nurse and have their immune status assessed on that basis and then a certificate to show whether that person is compliant or not with the policy directive will be the key document. We have these refusal forms and part of the reason for going down that pathway is there is some good published evidence, particularly for influenza vaccination, that by going through the process of sitting down with a healthcare worker, pointing out the pros and cons of immunization, and getting them to look at the implications for them, their workers, their patients, their fellow workers and patients, and having to sign the form, 
they might not actually get to the stage of signing the form. That might actually be sufficient motivation for that healthcare worker to go ahead and get the vaccination. So there is evidence to suggest that just adding that process can lead to a few healthcare workers at least agreeing to have the required vaccines. We have thousands of student healthcare workers in South Australia and we really want to minimise the impact on the education providers of that. So the agreement is that students will make a self-declaration of compliance. So on the basis of their certificate of compliance, they will declare to their university that they are compliant with the policy directive. So to give some integrity to the process, we're looking at a random audit process. And we figured that if in the first year or two we do enough students so the rumour mill, they talk to each other and say, I was audited, um, that might lend some weight to it. But that's really a, a feasible solution to it. A random audit, as is done for criminal history checks as well. So to see how, we're, how compliance is going. So what will be on the website is a set of frequently asked questions. Uh, a document, a very short two-page document, contraindications to vaccination, literally just taken out of the immunisation handbook but put in a nice sort of little two-page form. Some information about the immunisation expert advisory panel. And for some of the SA Health organisations, a little checklist to see what you need to do to get ready to um, implement the policy directive. I should say, though, that most local health networks and SAS are well advanced with this already. Uh, and in fact, most education providers have been because we've been talking about it for so long. Um, and there'll be a version of this PowerPoint presentation available as well, particularly for SA Health facilities if, if um, people want to use the PowerPoint to provide education sessions to staff. And then we've got a series of um, documents that help us behind the scenes. So how we're going to communicate to immunisation providers, to education providers, to laboratories and so on. We're going to form a, a, a working group for implementing the program, particularly involving senior worker health nurses from our local health networks and SAS. Um, we've got various consultation reports from the consultation we've been through, a, a workshop with education providers and so on. So let's now look at some of the implementation issues and that's about where I will be coming to a close so we can have some discussion. So we're proposing and each local health network can develop their own plan, a four year phased implementation and in that initial year the recommendation is to focus on staff working in higher risk areas, so emergency departments, operating theatres, oncology, each, each local health network can work out its own particular areas. Now at last report, um, SAS were close to completing their uh, requirements already in one year, which has been a lot of hard work, but fantastic work. So a phased implementation process, so it's not an onerous burden on people. For our worker health staff, there's going to be a change of focus, and I think for some there already has been. There has been quite a lot of work being done on assessing um, workers coming into the SA Health system, they're going to be self-assessed by, well, assessed by medical practitioners, GPs, prior to coming into the system. So that frees up the worker health nurses to focus on existing staff, higher risk staff initially, and gradually through other staff. Obviously, and this is one of the purposes of this presentation, is to provide information and then any necessary capacity building for the staff who are going to be involved in implementing the policy directive. We want to carefully monitor if there are instances of refusal, hoping it can be dealt with at a local level first and not needing to escalate to a, an immunisation expert advisory panel. And looking at some of the management options. So we really don't have a management option of dismissing current SA Health staff from their positions if they're not compliant. So we need to look at a range of options for staff who, it's a very, very small number of staff who refuse vaccination but are in uh, high risk situations a midwife who refuses pertussis vaccination, for example. What are the management options in that particular scenario? And we have had um, positive and negative feedback from some of the industrial groups around this policy directive, and this won't be any surprise to you, but privacy, confidentiality, autonomy, my right, and discrimination, I'm being discriminated against. So ways of dealing with those particular issues, we need to respect that they are issues for some people and be able to have a respectful dialogue uh, with our opponents, no, with those who are not so enthusiastic about this policy directive as some of us. 
uh, and we will be talking to the education providers about the random audit and the reporting process. So I have a couple of other little slides that I can, we can look at depending on the discussion on some of the management options, but I'm happy to open it up for discussion and questions now. Any questions? What about contractors? Mm. So spotless, um, they're at the coal phase, they get needle stick injuries, um, we don't know their immune status, and then the security officers bite, scratches, aggressive patients, mm. and no one in these private contracting companies are providing any immunisation support to these staff? Look, that's, uh, every speaker says this, don't we? That's a very good question. Um, as we've developed the policy directive, the scope keeps getting expanded. I mean, a, a couple of years ago, we discovered a large cohort of um, dental therapist nurses trained at TAFE that we hadn't even thought of initially. So it's the work role, so if there is uh, a likely exposure to blood, blood products and so on, then that there needs to be some way of addressing that. Hopefully you, you deal with a lot of that just through good work practices. But this is primarily addressed to healthcare workers rather than those particular groups. So it may well be that different strategies need to be approached through their employers to say that if these are risks from a, uh, working in a healthcare system, then you should have your hepatitis B vaccine if there's vaccine available in the market. Another question down here? Uh, yeah, I've just got a um, quick question. Uh, GPs that might be contracted to, say, country <laughs> health hospitals, will they be expected to um, do all this? Because I work in a um, GP practice mm -hmm. and we already do refusal forms and consent forms and everything and offer immunisations. But they're usually the most problem I have is with the GPs. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I have been, we've had, had discussions with our Country Health SA colleague, hi Luda, um, and, and recognising that that is an issue. So some of these GPs will actually need to be compliant with the policy directive because they're, they have a contract with a particular health service anyway. Um, otherwise, we're hoping that the GPs will actually be our main allies in doing the screening and process and providing support through them. So um, in our communication package, we've got a whole set of letters ready to go out to rural doctors, uh, College of Rural and Remote Medicine, and so on. Um, do you have any suggestions as to how we can make that work? <laughs> I think as... As a, as a former GP, I don't want to criticise my colleagues. Um, the university health services in, a, in Metro Adelaide clearly see a lot of student healthcare workers. They know exactly what they're doing. They're, they're an excellent resource. There may well be GPs who don't deal much in immunisation and they, they're seeing student healthcare workers and they don't really know what to do. And we've had ongoing discussions, which I hope are resolved on, on you know, who should have serology and who shouldn't before vaccination and who should have serology and who shouldn't after vaccination. So, you know, post-vaccination serology for chickenpox is just not recommended full stop. So those sorts of issues. Do you have a question there, Steve? Hello. Um, I work in an occupational health clinic, and just in regard to the query about Spotless, uh, all their employees, since the new RA, all their employees are required to be screened for uh, hepatitis A and B. Um, tetanus, diphtheria, whooping cough. Uh, they're required to have their influenza. They're required to have proof of polio. If they don't have proof of immunity, they have to have the complete schedule to, to work for the in the. Thank you. That, that's interesting. The required to have proof of polio could be somewhat problematic because we don't really want people going having a, a repeat primary course of polio. But it, it depends what the fine print is, doesn't it, in that? Right. 
we're not going down that pathway. We're saying if you are prepared to say, I, if I'm pre prepared to say I've had my primary course of polio, that's acceptable as good. Polio is not an issue in SA health facilities. So I think that's a little bit over the top, some of those requirements. Some of the others are great. One over here. Hi. Um, this is a quick question. Will the um, policy directive affect also the, will it relate directly rather to the work health and safety policy of uh, uh, SA Health? Um, so in, if someone is, I don't know, affected by uh, a communicable disease and they don't, they're a refuser, then will their claim necessarily be, um, sorry? Do you want to pass the microphone to Karen to answer that? Because that might be a, a good way to get an answer. So if a worker develops, say, chicken pox, and the patient is known to have chicken pox and it was in the time frame, if you put in a claim, your claim should be accepted. There is a no-fault system. So even if that person refused to have their vaccine, you can't stop the claim. So unfair, but yes. Hello, Doug. Um, who will be, uh, who will consist of the expert advisory panel? Who will make that up? So, after the 9th of October, you can go on the website and download the document and have a look at it. So, let's see if what I can remember. So, there will be uh, an infectious diseases physician, uh, a doctor from the communicable disease control branch, a representative from that particular local health network, probably someone from workforce relations, uh, the healthcare worker and a support person are also entitled to come along to the panel. I think I've missed someone else in that, but it, as I say, we, we have run this once before with a, a student healthcare worker and we've got a feel as to how it would go. But we're trying to have a, an open, transparent, consistent process so that across all of SA Health, you know, there's no, the same process would be followed and we're hoping it will be very rare. Um, just a general question. Um, we have a national immunisation database and some states also have some. Is, there, is that going to be one eventually and are we going to be able to tap into that or what? Uh, so who's best placed to answer <laughs> the Australian immunisation register question? Ultimately, yes. yes. Thank you. Yes. We're headed in that direction. At the moment, we've got the, the, the child immunisation register, we've got the HPV register, but ultimately we're planning to add adult vaccinations and a whole of life zosters on. Thank you. And Luda? And that'll be wonderful. Um, I'm just wondering about the immunisation courses. How do you the immunisation courses as well, because they're different. Like, I've, I'm an immunisation provider in Western Australia, but I have to do the SA uh, health immunisation course to be able to do it here. Is there any chance of it being a national training? Can someone answer that question? Um, the only comment I can make about that is there's a, in, um, it's in the plans with the National Immunisation Education Framework, but that's not happening, won't, ha won't be ticked off for a few years. Um, that was the last comment that I had from a meeting, and I think Angela went to the meeting and I read the minutes from it. Um, my comment, Doug, is to support what you said as a consistent approach and what there is going to be an implementation working group with representation from all the LHNs. So those of you guys from the different LHNs, we are working together to have a consistent approach about implementing this policy directive, working collaboratively in, a pa in partnership. Sorry, these are the words that um, are really important um, with SA Health to make sure that we have less hiccups and respond consistently across all SA Health. Okay, any last questions? We have one more question here and I think we'll wrap it up after that. It's four o'clock on Friday. As a healthcare worker in the maternity unit, and we're, all, we're covered by pertussis, how long do we know, like when do we have to have another vaccination? Because there's thoughts out there that it's five years, some say 10 years, and so it's unsure. Look, we're sticking to 10 years between booster doses, but we know after three or four years, immunity is going to fade. I mean, it's, it's not our best vaccine. It's a good vaccine. It does provide protection. 
but you know, we can't be, be, and also because the pertussis vaccine is bundled with diphtheria tetanus, we don't want to be giving the diphtheria tetanus too frequently either for the risk of some hypersensitivity reactions and things like that. Any additions, Helen, from your perspective? 10 years. Okay, so you could have one beforehand, but it's not going to be a requirement. If you've got docu for the purposes of this policy directive, if you've got documented evidence of a boost in the last 10 years, we'll give you a tick. Uh, Always sorry, yeah. Would that apply to partners of pregnant women as sorry? well? Would that apply to partners of pregnant So this women? is only covering SA health workers. Yeah. That's a separate issue. And yes, they may, that may well be recommended as part of what people have called a cocooning type strategy to protect those uh, provide immunisation around the newborn child. Mm. But, you know, vaccination for the pregnant woman is far and away the best thing to go. Is that what yeah. I'm supposed to say, Helen? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Please join me in uh, thanking Dr. Rebecca. We just invite Helen to come up to uh, close um, this meeting. Helen. And thanks for that um, last session. That was um, great. You know, not saying thanks for my presentation, but the others. Um, and what I really wanted to thank you, um, you know, is for coming, for attending. But also, um, I love this meeting because it's so interactive, and there are so many questions, and everyone is so keen and on the topic, um, and provides some really um, interesting discussion points. So we hope it's valuable for you as well. It's very valuable for us to understand um, what's happening out in the community as well. So those forms that you have um, around um, suggestions for um, topics even for next year. So this year we very much responded healthcare workers, one of the topics that was put, has been put down two years in a row. So any topics that you'd like to have more of an update on, please let us know. Also about the venue. Um, I think this is a beautiful venue. It's been great. Hands up who prefers this venue to last year's venue. Yeah, so pretty much, yeah, about 50%. Um, any other suggestions for venues as well? But um, what I'd like to do is, again, thank um, us, uh, all the speakers, particularly those who've travelled from interstate, because it really does take up a whole day to be able to get here and um, give a presentation. I'd also like to thank the um, committee um, who have invested a lot of time in organising this, um, which I think has been a great day. So for, uh, to, thanks to Breda McDonald, Sarah Ely and um, Kate Riley. Also our sponsors that I mentioned at the beginning. So um, SA Health Samri, Women's and Children's Health Network and Robinson Research Institute, University of Adelaide. Um, our helpers, Mary Walker, um, Beck Marsland, Leah uh, Stepanovic, um, Susan Lee, Chris, Chris Heath, Michelle Clark, Bing Wang, Mark Mc McMillan, um, Hassan Mohammed. Pip Brockus and Leslie McCauley. So thanks to everyone. Um, thanks to our chairs as well. And um, I think to the audiovisual team too. I think they had great support for the audiovisual. Thank you. You can all go home now.